Uh, I'm Alex. I work at Red Hat uh, in the desktop group, meaning usually I'm a GNOME kind of guy. But the last couple of years, I've been working on something called Flatpak. And this, this talk is about Flatpak. Uh, title says it's about Portal, which is our way to do dynamic permissions. Uh, but you know, to, to explain that, I also have to explain some, some of what Flatpak is and what, how it works. And uh, here's what it is. How many people have ever heard of a Flatpak? Most people. How many people used it? Some people. All right, so it's an application distribution and deployment mechanism for desktop applications on Linux. On Linux, because we use kernel stuff that don't really exist anywhere else. Um, and, and for desktop application, meaning X app, Wayland apps, things, things that are run on the desktop. Uh, so w the idea is that you build your thing on your machine, put it somewhere on the internet, and people can download it and run it on their systems. And we have two major goals. One is cross-distribution deployment, meaning I should be able to run whatever distro I want at whatever version, build an app, ship it, and whoever runs it should like, be able to run whatever distro he wants and be able to upgrade the version or whatnot, and the app will keep running. And the second goal is that we want to have some, some level of sandboxing between apps, between apps and the, the system, um, like protect your user file from the apps, pr protect apps against each other. Now, the second goal is kind of optional. Like, you really need to modify apps to make them really work in a sandbox fashion. So initially, many of the apps we uh, currently use uh, ship as flat packs are not really sandbox. All the games are, for instance, because they're easy to sandbox. But other apps are harder. So we'll try slowly moving towards more and more things being sandbox. But you know, the first goal is always met. The second one is kind of a goal. Uh, and, and then we're talking about apps. Uh, and, and this is clearly like a reference to iOS and uh, Android style apps, not necessarily like web style apps. Uh, and, and those are fundamentally different than containers, because containers implies a server something. Usually a server, a container is a network facing service or like support for a network serving ser a service, like a database or something. And that, that's fundamentally a different context than what uh, a desktop app runs in. Like they're probably running on, on a, a, a machine that doesn't have graphical output. It has a sysadmin that man manages it. Maybe it's a cluster, so there's like a logging framework. Someone gets paged when it goes down. That is very dissimilar to the kind of ad hoc system that an app runs in. Like it, get, it gets launched when the user launches it, and he, he clicks a click on, on the uh, close button, and it goes away. So it's a very different kind of situation. It relies on all these services that we expect to be in a, in a Unix uh, graphical session, the X server, or Wayland, or whatever, Pulse Audio, Dbus, all these things that are very specific to the desktop. And everything runs as the user UID. Not only does anything run, never, like nothing ever runs as root, we cannot really require root in any way. Like People who run these things are not system admins, so they should never be able to run something as root, like not something generic as root. Some systems use multiple UIDs, like Android does for, for app isolations, but we can't really do that and, 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 and still be traditional Unix. Like you log in your session, we can't create multiple users for you. There's all sorts of issues with file ownerships and like being able to have UIDs across machines and stuff. And um, containers typically use some kind of overlay file system or a copy and write system where they can just write to user share. Like the app can just write in the system wherever, install a new RPM. But uh, desktop apps typically, like if you install an RPM of the GIMP, 
it cannot write to user share. Everything always goes in your user's home directory, which is very different from, from how containers work, but actually is how all currently existing Unix uh, desktop app works already, so it's not a problem. We don't do the overlay system. Instead, we have a very simple split. The, the runtime supplies slash user, and the app uh, supplies something called slash app, which has the bundles for the app. Uh, this way, we can get, so, so the runtime is kind of like the base layer in, in, a, uh, in a Docker or whatever container system, but they're like two separate um, two separate images that get updated automatically on, like, even if you didn't update the app, if the runtime changes because there's a glibc update or whatever, the app will automatically inherit it. Whereas in, in, the, in the Docker, you would need to rebase on the, on the uh, base layer or whatever. And then it uses something called OS3. I, I think OS3 is really cool. I don't really have time to go into the details of it, but it's kind of like a huge Git repository where every branch in the repository is an app. And then we check out the apps. They're hard linked, so it doesn't actually use extra space. But in the end, each app and each runtime is just a tree of files, like regular files. And, and it has a subdirectory called files, which actually has the files. And then there's a key, key value file called metadata that gives extra information about, you know, What's the application name? What architecture was it built for? What environment variables do we want to set? You know, what command do we launch by default? And then there is a, a directory called exports. And the exports are the way that the installed app in, in, integrate with the system, right? So if anyone is used to Linux desktop stuff, these are not weird. These are the typical ways that, uh, that the free desktop standards for how apps integrate with this. Uh, the session, basically, with uh, your desktop. So we take these files. Desktop files is how you appear in the menus. Uh, deeper service files, if, if your app is a deeper service. We can add MIME types, saying I handle these kind of extension. If you see one of these, open with me. And, and we expose these. From, from all the currently installed apps, we collect all these in a single directory that we hand off to the desktop so that it can uh, see these apps as regular apps in, in the menu. So you wouldn't notice anything different between these apps. They used to appear in your desktop, and you click on the icon, and it spawns, and it just works. Uh, there are some limitations. We know about these file types. We can like rewrite them to be safe, so you can't expose debus service files that execute some weird commands. Instead of like everything that you launch will be uh, sandboxed in Flatpak and stuff. And then when you run it, we always have some kind of sandbox. Like we fundamentally, it's based on file system namespaces, so we can make things look uh, like it's not the whole system. So there's always some level of sandboxing. Uh, and it uses a project called Bubble Wrap. Uh, Bubble Wrap was originally part of Flatpak way back when it was called XDG App. So it was like the XDG App Helper that was later extracted because a lot of people were interested in using bubble wrap by itself. Bubble wrap is a command line wrapper for the kernel container system. There's like namespaces, seccomp, all these things, uh, which is you know, in, in, many, in many ways not super dissimilar from run C or something like that. But the major interesting part of bubble wrap is that the features it exposes are only those that we can implement using unprivileged user namespaces. So on this machine running Fedora with user namespaces in the kernel, bubble wrap is a regular app that doesn't need any extra permissions. And yet it can create sandboxes for me. It's very useful for testing or debugging, and you can grant give give this to any user and they can like create their own sandboxes for doing de development or whatever. So a lot of people are, are using it to, to sandbox stuff in the desktop in general. Uh, but it also has a mode where it's set UID. And since it's only ever exposing like a, a real minor subset of what user, unprivileged user namespaces is, 
it is generally considered something safe that you can ship to users, even though it's set UID. Uh, it uses these basic privileges. No, no new privs is how uh, we make user namespaces safe. Uh, we basically unshare all those uh, namespaces, and we create a, a complete from scratch file system hierarchy based on the root being a tempfs, where we build up like directory, like slash temp is just a directory on the tempfs, but uh, slash user and slash app are bind mounts to the actual data, like read only bind mount to the data from the from the app. Uh, there's some minimal like dev and processes. And then there is a directory in your home directory, which is per app, dot var app app ID, which is the only place you could write to that persists by default. Like, and then we set up the environment, like there's this XTG directory specification. We set these up to point in there, so most apps just automatically write there. We use seccomp. Seccomp is very low level, so it's hard to make a generic seccomp profile that is useful for all apps. But, but we do have some use of it. Like we, we don't allow recursive containers. We don't, by default, give access to ptrace and perf and uh, some, some lower level things. Uh, we also use systemd dash dash user. If, if you have a user systemd session, we use it to set up a scope, uh, which is a way to get a C group for, for our processes. We can't currently actually set any C group uh, like properties, like memory limits or anything, because that's that, that, that currently requires root privileges. But apparently, maybe with the new C group v2, we can maybe do uh, limitations too, but that's eventually. To make things work uh, well for desktop apps, we punch some holes in it by default. Uh, so dbus is a very common way for, for uh, desktop apps to talk to each other. And by dbus here, I mean the session dbus, not the global one. Uh, but, but we always let apps talk to the bus, but we do so via a filtering proxy. So they don't really talk to the bus, and they're not really allowed to do much. What they can do is own their own application ID as a name on the bus, and they can reply to other people that can talk to you. Uh, we also expose some files from the host, like the fonts and the icons, which are very useful because if you, say, inherit the default font in your app, you better like be able to read the font file or nothing works. Uh, there's some configuration options, uh, configuration files that we need, the resolve conf, local time. There's a journal socket there so you can log stuff. Uh, Sys and Etsy machine ID are visible, so we're not trying to anonymize the host. Like, it's really hard to do that because apps will need to look for PCI IDs to load the right OpenGL driver and things like that. So we're not anonymizing the machine. We're just giving it, this is, this is how it is. We used to hide the user stuff from it. And then there's this fuse amount that's always get there, which is from something called the document portal, which I get to or into more detail later. But, but on top of this, applications can request more access, like punch more holes in this thing. Uh, and it's, it's something that the app lists. To install, I will need to have access to these things. And the user can then like decide to not install it, or you can actually override them. But like chances are, if you do, things don't work. But you, you can if you want. And these are the things, basically, you can, uh, you can grant access to a particular directory, like read-only access to my photos, my, the, the XG photo directory. Or you, you, you can use granted access to all my home directory or the entire system. Um, you can grant it network access, IPC access. These are basically unshared uh, namespaces, or shared, rather. Uh, you can ask for more device nodes. Common thing is you want to have access to USB devices because you want to need to do some kind of a user space USB driver like a joystick or some weird thing. Um, you can ask for sockets. And, and by sockets, I mean Unix domain sockets. They just get mounted into your file system like the, so you can talk to the X server 
Wayland compositor, pulse audio daemon, and you can ask for actually raw dbus access if you want. You can also ask for loosening up the rules for seccomp, like if you're a debugger or something, you might want to have ptrace access uh, or perf access. Uh, you can ask for access to more dbus names. I want to talk to this particular dbus service. I want to be able to implement this other dbus name. Um, we don't actually have a UI for the, for the asking about user permissions right now. All the, all the backend stuff is implemented, but since most apps so far are basically not very sandboxed, it hasn't yet been a um, priority to have the UI, because it's really complicated to translate like really low-level system permissions to something that you know a regular user can understand. What does it mean that you have pulse audio access? It's just very hard. So we have to come up with some way to describe these in easy to understand ways. But static permissions are fundamentally lame. Uh, it's like the old school uh, Android permission system where you ask for this long list of things. Do you want to do this? How would you know if you want or not? You haven't even run the app yet. You don't know if it's any good. Sometimes it's unavoidable. Many, many things are fundamentally set up when you launch the container. And it's, really hard to avoid setting up them up ahead of time. But when possible, we should avoid to use static permissions and instead use something called portals. Uh, portal is a word we made up a bunch of years ago at a hackfest here in Berlin, actually. Um, it is a name for a service that runs on the host, so it's not sandboxed. But there is a hole in all the sandboxes allowing them to talk to the portal. And, and the interface you use, the API you expose on the portal, is designed to be safe to handle this. And, and safe is a very vague word, but basically it's been decided by whoever wrote the portal that this is something we deem safe. And mostly this is done by having things be interactive. So when you request or you do an operation on a portal, almost always that, that will uh, be a dialogue shown to the user or, or some kind of conversation with the user. And that way, the sandboxed app can't really misuse this in a way that the user isn't aware of. Like if if, if the unexpectedly there's a billion dialogues popping up, you know that the app is doing something wrong. And, and if, you, if you did, or even if there's just one, but you didn't expect that, you wouldn't be typing like sensitive information in it. In fact, you would probably close the window, which is another important part of being a portal. If you're cancelable, you can always abort and say, I didn't want this, so I'm going to close this, and the app has to accept that. Yeah. And, and, and third, we want to have a way that the portal can, in a trusted way, know what, what, what's doing this call. Like, can I give an ID for this thing so I can store things like permissions? If, if it asks for permissions, maybe I want to remember the permission for the duration of the session or something. So it doesn't have to keep asking all the time. So that's basically how portals are supposed to work. I want to do an example here. Uh, so here, I'm running a GNOME recipes, but I, instead of running GNOME recipes, I just run a shell in it. So it looks like I have my home directory here. Oh, oh whatever. It's, it's just nothing there. It just looks like it. So in general, we try to expose uh, a subset of what's on the host in the sandbox. We never make up paths that don't exist outside the sandbox. So it has the same, um, has the same name, but it's nothing there. There is the var app directory where we can store persistent data. And if I run the app, oh, it got up here. Ah. Uh, it, it works. This is uh, 
an app that is uh, useful on its own, but it's also kind of an experimental thing where we can play with sandboxing. So, so this is an app that runs fully sandboxed, and you can like do recipes and stuff on it. But you can also create your own recipes. Uh, and if you want to have a photo for it, oh shit, that's really high DPI for the win. Anyway, it looks like I can see my home directory here, and I can like load a file. Uh, and I can make cat soup or whatever. Uh, it, it didn't look like anything special. Like you clicked on the open thing, and things just you just expected there to be a dialogue. So it goes when it works, it go, and it, it's the natural flow. It works really, really well. Basically, what happened was that the file chooser was running outside the sandbox. But choosing it and clicking OK implicitly gave permission to access just this one file and nothing else. And, and the app itself was not in any way in control of what was happening uh, in, the, uh, in the sandbox. Uh, yeah, that's... So what was happening here? There's a portal called the XTG desktop portal. Uh, it's, it's running as a service on the host, and by host, I actually mean it's a service on the session bus running as the user inside the session. So it's not a root thing, it's just a regular thing running in your session. And it gets the request. In this case, we, it's a dbus call, and it looks at uh, the request, and it gets the, the peer the, uh, application ID, and it calls out to the back end, in this case, UTK. If you were running a KDE uh, system, you, it would spawn the uh, KDE file chooser. And if you want, you can plug in your other back and set us non-interactive things if you want or whatever. Uh, the back end did all the UI work uh, and sent back the final file, uh, file name that um, the user selected or you know, whether it was canceled or so. And then we take another portal called the document portal, and we call it and say, give me a document ID for this particular file name, and also let this application ID give read access to it. And then we pass the document ID back to the app, and now it can read the file. Uh, this uh, way we get the application ID is kind of weird right now. Uh, we look in this file, propid root dot flatback info, in Flatpak, make sure that all uh, sandboxes you create have that file. It's read-only. The app cannot modify it. It cannot use uh, recursive namespaces, so it cannot fool itself in some other ways. It looks like there's a PID race here, but actually the PID is the uh, Dbus proxy PID, which lives outside the sandbox, so it's out of control and will live as long as the uh, uh, any file in the sandbox. However, it's really shitty to have this proxy daemon and this proc stuff. So we're actually working upstream with Docker daemon to have a proper sandbox uh, ID and list of permissions in, in Dbus daemon itself. Uh, the, 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 the document portal is, is basically like a tiny database where you can create unique IDs for a Pat name, and then on the side, there's a Fusive file system where you can access all those files. So in this, in this case, there's a Fuse amount and XTG render uh, that has all the, uh, is there a pointer on this thing? Uh, whatever. So all the uh, unique, name, unique IDs are listed as directories, and underneath them, there's the, the actual file. So you can get the file name, you can get file name, uh, access to the file, and if you have write permissions, you can replace it. But there's also a separate subdirectory by, called by app. And beneath that, there are all the apps that have been using this. And they have subsets of the entire tree in them. So they're filtered by the uh, permissions they have. And when we run the app in the flat pack, like the, the, the recipes subdirectory will be mounted at the top. So it will only see its own files and will only have uh, the right read-write permissions it has. So there's basically multiple views of the entire database. 
uh, and you get only get to see yours. Uh, you can modify files if you have access rights, but all modifications are turned into atomic updates on, on the host or from the point of view of a different app. So you like you can replace the file in its entirety. You cannot write in the middle of a thing that someone else has open. Uh, also, the document portal is accessible by apps, even though they're sandboxed. Uh, because uh, the way you register a file name, you actually pa open a file descriptor, like an OPATH file descriptor, and pass it to the app. So you can prove that you have access to this file. Then you can create a, a, a document ID for it. So this is also a way for a sandboxed app to talk to a different sandboxed app and grant it permission to its files, which is quite useful. Uh, the Dbus API for the portal itself is quite easy. So there's a single call, open file, it passes a bunch of uh, properties. Like the first one is basically the X ID for the window so that you want to parent to, and then the dialog title and a bunch of file chooser options. And then it returns uh, the uh, a reference handle to the request object. So it doesn't require, it doesn't wait until it's done. It immediately returns a request object, which is kind of a reference to this long-running dialog. Because in, t in case your app is terminating or the window is closing or something, you can terminate the request and close the dialog. And you can wait for the signal to get the user's actual response. We have a bunch of uh, portals. Uh, the file chooser portal is, is the one I talked about, but we have a, something called the open URI portal, where you can basically hand over a URI. Um, and then there would be some kind of UI saying what app do you want to open this in. And uh, when you choose that, you can open it in that. and. Actually, I think we, these days we don't actually ask about uh, HTTP URIs. We used to open them in your, at least if you have a, only have a single browser installed, it just directly opens them. But that turns out a very important portal because almost all apps have like an about page where you open up the, uh, the browser to their home page or online documentations. But there's also an open file portal, which is basically the same, but instead of passing a, a URI, we pass a open file descriptor, uh, because we don't want to allow open URI to do file colon URIs, because then you can easily basically tell it to open things with yourself with any path name you want. So it's doing the same thing, but you, can, you have to open the file descriptor first and then pass it over. We have an email portal. Basically, it opens a pre-populated uh, email client window where you, you can get you can give it the subject the address and you can start typing and send or if you didn't want to send it you can use close the thing uh, we have a printer portal means that the entire printing dialog is running outside the control of your app the app doesn't see the list of printers on your system it doesn't see the configuration of the printer it doesn't actually talk to the printers like what happens is that the dialog lets you configure the, the details of the print, and you will return only the information required needed to uh, format your page or whatever. And, and then you feed it a PDF, and then the portal itself does the spooling to the, to the printer. So the, we, we never talk to the printer from directly from the app. In fact, it could print to a network printer even though the app doesn't have network access. Uh, there's a screenshot portal which basically gives you a screenshot a window with a screenshot, and you can crop it and whatnot, and you click on OK, and it returns the results back to the, uh, the app. There's an account portal, which lets you basically, it's, it's, it's a standardized way of something called GNOME uh, accounts, which is access to your OAuth uh, authentication. You can give your Google account access or, or Twitter account access. Inhibit and notifications are also basically wrappers around the system things for inhibiting screensaver, inhibiting suspend, uh, doing notifications. But the important thing is that we're going through the portal so we, can, we, we have a point where we can decide 
like the user listed these apps as allowed to do notification, and, and if you're not allowed, we can use silence it and it doesn't appear. So uh, on GNOME, for instance, if you go to the control center, there's a list of all the apps, and you can say these are allowed to do notifications, and the rest can use you know, disappear. Uh, network monitor and proxy resolver are a bit different. Uh, they don't actually do UI. They, I think they use look at uh, the properties of the remote uh, of, of the app that talks to them. And if it has network access, it just allows them to do this. Uh, the network monitor does like state it changes whether you're online, whether you're offline. These are possible to do in the sandbox, but uh, it also talks to things like network manager to tell whether you're on a under a captive portal or like gives extra information that's harder to do if you don't have real host access. The proxy resolver is basically a way to do proxy configuration without having to shove the configuration into the port, into the uh, sandbox. Uh, we also have an IBUS portal. IBUS is a input method framework for complicated scripts like Chinese, Japanese. Um, it's a plugin framework where there's a Dbus API that the client uses to talk to, and it turns out that the Dbus API is very, very wide, and you can like have it load plugins and pretend to be an input method mechanism and read everyone's key presses and stuff. So we have a portal which is only exposing the the minimal API required for a sandboxed app to itself do input in Chinese or, or whatever. Other than the, the, the pure portals, there's also services that, that act like portals. Wayland is like the, the original portal. It allows you to do input and output, but it doesn't give you any way to talk to other clients, like where X is completely open about everything, and you can easily you know, use X messages to find your root terminal and send it keyboard input. In, in uh, Wayland, a single client cannot even mention uh, the uh, other app client's windows. There's just not, no way in the protocol to even, use, to even refer to them. Pipewire is, is a project that we're working on, which is basically taking Pulse Audio but, but making it uh, work for uh, video. And, and by default, or initially, it was all about webcams and things like that. But it's also been used for screencasting. So if, if you want to like, get a screen grab or, or a video of the screen, so you can do screencasting or, or similar uh, tools, then you can use Pipewire to get a file descriptor that gives you basically a stream of video for, for the frames. Uh, and it's useful also if you want to have a something like a webcam that you want multiple apps to access to. Because right now, what you do is you open the device physically, and then you have a lock on it, and nobody else can access it. Whereas Pipewire just like is a central point that can dispute to many users. Uh, GeoClue is our geopositioning API, like GPS and uh, Wi-Fi-based location. It isn't currently a portal. It's using a. It's actually like a, 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 a service running as root on the system bus, but it has some kind of callback framework where it detects that you're a flat pack, and then it asks the the, the desktop to show you some permissions dialog. It's kind of weird, but it does work. Uh, although I, I think we eventually want to move that towards like a standard portal model. Uh, Pulse Audio actually is the reverse of a uh, of a portal because it, it's super open and you can lo you can basically poke on any stream from any app and you can upload or you can tell the daemon to load DLLs and stuff. But there's work in progress to tying it down, having some kind of security framework, and eventually, hopefully, it will be possible to make it safe. We have a bunch of work to do. Uh, well, the main thing is to make apps use portals. 
we try our best to make the APIs, for instance, in GTK and Glib and Qt and the KDE libraries, to make them automatically use this. Uh, or, or expose new APIs that, that underneath just uses this. And, you know, maybe it uses them on when they run in the sandbox, but use something else when they're outside. Although the portals work perfectly fine, even if you're not sandboxed. Uh, so so they, they might be useful in general. We need to design, uh, decide how to expose static permissions and do some kind of user interface study on how to best expose all of that. Uh, we, I want to work with the Dbus upstream to make the Dbus proxy go away for performance reason and just like general clean cleanliness. Pipewire is, is a new project, so its its goal is to be run in Flatpak and, and to be very secure, but it's not actually right now implemented. Um, uh, like the integration is not implemented, so there's some work needed there. Okay. Uh, the the uh, apps often, like desktop app, often need access to the uh, certificates on the on the host. Basically, if you have a site-wide certificate for your company or something, it's typically loaded on all your machines. But the way uh, sandboxing and, and continuous work, you don't really have access to all the uh, cert uh, certificate files. We ship our own certificate store uh, or see a certificate in the runtime. And uh, there's really no sane way to expose the files because they're in, in, in a, between different distros, they are in completely different ways, different file names, different formats. So P11 kit has this daemon for exposing PKCS11 modules over, over Dbus, or at least some kind of Unix domain socket. So I want to look into making that expose like a subset of your information, like read-only access to all your uh, CS certificates. It uh, would be nice because then we could just give the container access to that and it could pick up the, any certificates automatically. Dconf is the uh, GNOME JK uh, preference storage system. Uh, we want to, we have actually initial work on making it sandbox so that you get basically it's a tree of configuration option. It would be cool if you got your own tree that you could see and uh, you couldn't see anything else, but you always got access to your own tree. So I think that's blocking on the Dbus work, so both of those are related. I guess I kind of run out of slides, so if you have any questions. Hey. Uh, what do you use to send a big file through a portal, for example, to print a PDF? Hmm? Uh, how do you send a file through a portal if you need to print a PDF with a... a oh, print? you stream it over Dbus to the portal, and the portal uses uh, cups or whatever to stream it to the printer. So all, all the data go through Dbus, I guess? Yeah, I, I don't actually... Matthias might know better. How do we send the actual PDF? Uh, I'm not sure, actually. I mean, we could just pass a file descriptor or something, but I don't, I don't know for sure right now how we do it. But yes. you don't necessarily have to write all the bytes. You could pass a file descriptor or something. Uh, but I don't, at this moment, re remember exactly how it works. So uh, does the sandboxing allow you to do things like, like if you have a, an Ethernet controller that you want to shift so that it's inside the Flatpak application, but it's not visible outside? Come again? So if you have an, a network interface that is currently on like EATH1. Yeah, on the you, host. Yes, yeah. and you want to move that so that it's visible inside the, the flat pack um, application, but not on the outside. Yeah, so we, we, can, we only have two stages for network. Either we share the, the uh, network entirely by sharing the same network namespace, and then everything will look as if you're on the outside. Or we do our own network and namespace and set up only loopback and you have no Ethernet connection at all. 
And, and this is kind of unfortunate, but there's no way to do anything better without also having root access. Because you have to set up like bridges and, and it is really complicated and there's no way to do that without permissions. There's actually like work upstream on the uh, eBPF, eBPF uh, networking stuff that could possibly be used, but that's root only at the moment. According to uh, Leonard, there's no real reason for it to not be usable as a user. So maybe in the future we can use that, but then we can basically do per, per app, you know, whatever kind of filtering, only access this IP address or whatever. But right now, the, the only thing we can do is, is all or nothing. All right, no more questions, but we're out of time anyway, so thanks. <laughs>